Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Carr, and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, the ABM Tools Network, uh, which is coordinated by NatureServe. And uh, the co sponsor for this webinar is openchannels.org, uh, and we have Nick Weiner on uh, co hosting the webinar with, with me. Um, and we're very pleased to have Chris Costello and Ray Hilborn, Chris Costello from UCSB and Ray Hilborn from the University of Washington, on um, to talk about the Ocean Prosperity Roadmap and, and uh, the effects of, oh, wait, then fishery recovery. All right, slightly different change in title, and that's good. Um, so um, I will, wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions before we get started. There's two ways you can ask questions to Chris and Ray. You can type the questions into the question panel, and I'll see them, and I can relay them to Chris and Ray. Um, during, the web, during the actual presentation, uh, I'll just relay quick clarifying questions if I need to, and I'll hold substantive questions for the end, because um, we'll, we'll have at least 20 minutes for Q&A at the end. Um, another way you can ask questions is to raise your, your virtual hand. There's a little hand icon in your user interface. You um, can click that. Your, your little virtual hand will go up. I'll see it, and I can unmute you. This uh, way of asking questions will only work if you have a working, if if you have a working microphone on your computer and you're using that, or if you've called in and you've entered your PIN number. Um, so anyway, we're very glad to have you on, Chris and Ray, and I'll turn it over to you now. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, this is Chris Costello speaking. I'm a professor of natural resource economics uh, and bioeconomics here at the Bren School at UC Santa Barbara. And I'll be kicking off the presentation, but before I do that, I think Ray uh, we'll introduce himself, and then I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. So, Ray? Yeah. Hi, I'm Ray Hilborn. I'm a professor at the School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences at the University of Washington. Okay, so what Ray and I would like to do is just spend probably 20 to 30 minutes this morning with a couple of short presentations, um, and I'll kick that off. Uh, this is the, the sort of culmination of a, a whole body of work that Ray and I and, and a large team of others have been involved with over the last couple of years. Um, we had a, a great opportunity to, to present a lot of this work at the uh, Global Ocean Summit in Portugal, which was held by The Economist magazine last June, so some of this material was released there. And then a number of other, a number of the things you'll hear about today are, you know, going into research papers that are either in press or, or in review right now. So we're very pleased to, to share these results with you. Uh, some of this is still somewhat preliminary because it's not yet published, but you'll get a little bit of a sneak peek um, as to what, what we're up to. So let me go ahead and get, get started. Um, make sure I can advance the slides here. So the, I'm going to try to address three questions in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. The first is, you know, just as a thought experiment, what would happen if you actually could recover or restore uh, global fisheries to the levels that scientists think are, are appropriate? What would be the effects on food? Would, you know, would you make more food than, than we're currently getting, for example? What would be the effects on profit or livelihoods of fishermen? And what would be the conservation implications of doing that? So it's a big question. It's a global scale question. And we're going to try to get a handle on that. Uh, secondly, uh, we'd like to ask the question about you know, wh what would be the costs of, of engaging in that kind of reform? And what are the distributional effects across countries? Do you sort of get more or less the same benefit or cost to, to, in, to all countries? Or are there big uh, distributional consequences? And finally, you know, does it take? 50 years or five years to achieve these kinds of recovery targets? And furthermore, how does that differ across countries? So I'm going to try to get at all this pretty quickly, and so I'll be just scratching the surface on the methods. I won't be getting into the details, but I think I'll, I'll try to give you a sense of how we address these questions, and I'll certainly get into the specific results. And I, I should have mentioned that this is part of a, a large body of work that uh, a number of people have contributed to, uh, including uh, researchers at the University of Washington, researchers at the uh, Environmental Defense Fund, our team at UC Santa Barbara, among, among many others, including Matt Elliott at, at California Environmental Associates and others. 
So this is just a flowchart of how we sort of organize our thinking in this project. We've compiled a new database that includes stock assessments and uh, data from the FAO. We've used those data to estimate the current status of fish stocks around the world, about 5,000 fisheries around the world. And, and then we've developed uh, policy scenarios so that we can project out into the future under each policy scenario for each fishery. And what that gives us is a tool that allows us to analyze the, the potential benefits or costs of alternative policy uh, scenarios. So for example, you can take a fishery from, uh, from New Zealand and ask what is its current status. You can say, well, how is it currently managed and what are some alternative uh, policy options for managing that into the future? And then we have a, a bioeconomic model that allows us to simulate what would happen in that fishery into the future under alternative management approaches. And then we call the sort of the difference between what you could get under a, let's say, an optimized fishery management system and what you either are getting now or would get under a business as usual scenario. And we call that difference the upside. Okay, this is just a picture from the FAO landings data. So these are reported landings to the FAO by year of wild fish production. And you can see that after about 1990 or so, it's more or less plateaued. And this has led a lot of people to say, well, we've reached the maximum capacity of the ocean, or perhaps we're well past it, and the only reason catches are staying high is that we keep uh, you know, engaging in more and more effort to, to catch these fisheries. So we started with kind of a theoretical analysis, and this is just a quick schematic of what that theory would say. So this is just a picture of the biological growth of, of any population. Think of it as a, a single fish stock. So the, the fish stock is on the x-axis, and the amount of food you could get on a sustained basis is on the y-axis. If you don't fish at all, you have a very large fish stock, but you also don't have any food, for people that is. If you fish a little bit, you drive the fish stock down a little, and you get a little bit of food out of that system. So that's a sustainable system but you aren't getting very much food very much food from the sea in that in that setting if you fish harder you get more food but you drive the fish stock down and if you fish even harder you further drive the stock down but interestingly the food you get from that actually stays the same or maybe even goes down and that continues in a case like this where you've severely depleted the stock and now you're getting almost no food out of the system and we think that a lot of fisheries in the world are in this red setting. It could be that lots of other fisheries are in this green setting. And we'd like to really have a good sense of where, where are these fisheries in the world. If you add economics to that model, this is just a simple way to add economics. So I've multiplied the curve times price. So that gives us the revenue in a fishery, so the income to fishermen. And the blue line indicates the cost in the fishery. So if you were to try to maximize the, the income or the livelihoods of fishermen, that would be the difference between the black and the blue line, and it would be at a point like this. But if you overfish and you drive the fish stocks too low, then you get lower food compared to what you could get. You get fewer fish in the water compared to what you could get, and you get lower profit compared to what you could get. So this is the sense in which you could have really dramatic benefits to conservation, uh, you know, fisher, fishermen income, and food, you know, food from fisheries by restoring fisheries. Now we've also addressed the possibility of uh, engaging in what you might call market reforms in fisheries, things like rights-based management that could raise prices or lower costs in fisheries, and that would still increase profits beyond the point that we, that we mentioned before. And I, also, I should have said I invite Ray to, of course, butt in and, and give his, his take on any of this. This is a definitely a, a collaborative piece of work. So we've done this analysis, this stock-by-stock -stock analysis of about 5,000 fisheries around the world that requires all kinds of economic and ecological data. We've projected under these management scenarios. One of those scenarios is what we call a business-as-usual or BAU scenario, and that tries to take account of how fisheries in the world are currently managed and simulate forward under those, uh, assuming management doesn't change in each country. 
But we also look at things like fishing to maximize yield or engaging in market reforms, as I mentioned before. And we're going to look at the trade-offs between food, profits, or livelihoods, and conservation. Um, our database covers about 77% of reported landings in the world. There's a large fraction that are just, too, I'll just leave it at this, too messy to deal with, <laughs> about 23%. So where are fisheries in the world? If you look, these are what people call COBE plots. So the horizontal axis gives a measure of the biomass status, where you might think of a 1.0 as a target. And the vertical axis is a measure of the fishing pressure in, in that fishery, where 1.0 is a target. The top left panel is all global fisheries from our, the estimates of our model. And what you see if you look at the green triangle is that on average, if you just sort of weight each fishery individually, on average fisheries have a biomass that's below the target and a fishing rate that's above the target. So we're fishing too hard and we're, you know, we've exploited fisheries too far. Now, that's on average. It turns out that the large fisheries of the world, the big food producers of the world, tend to be much farther down and to the right. And so you see there are a number of, there, there's a pretty big mass of points down and to the right, and that's a, that's a fairly conservative place to be because they're fishing at a relatively low rate and your, your biomass status is pretty high. So the, the sort of idea here is to take each of these points as a starting point and then simulate in, into the future and trace out where those points would go and what the effects on the you know, food, profit, and, and conservation would be. I've also plotted the COBE plot for a couple of different regions of the world to give you a sense of that regions are quite different. So the top right panel is, think of that as Alaska. The, those stocks are generally in quite good shape. The bottom left panel is, think of this as Europe. There's a real mix here with a lot of fisheries sort of in transition. And think of the bottom right as, as Asia, or part, a part of Asia where a lot of stocks are heavily overexploited. Okay, so if you run these scenarios out for each fishery and aggregate up by country, these are the results you get. So this is the change in profit in billions of dollars per year. This is for a single country, remember, versus the change in biomass and the size and, uh, the, sorry, the color indicates the change in catch, okay? So the first thing I want you to focus on on the left panel is that China is a huge outlier. China, according to our results, has a huge potential for upside in profit, biomass, and catch. We've just blown up all the other countries in the bottom left uh, in the right-hand panel. So you see countries like Indonesia, India, Japan, Philippines, all have a, a big potential upside. If you aggregate up to the whole world, these are the results. And I know there are lots of bubbles to focus on here. I want to just call your attention to two. So I'd like to call your attention to BAU on, in the bottom left and the green RBFM, or rights-based fishery management scenario. And that shows you the, the difference between biological outcomes and profit outcomes between, you know, if we continue to do things the way we are versus if we were to reform global fisheries in a certain way under our BFM. And so the, the wedge is quite large, and I'll summarize what that wedge is in just a minute. We also looked at the timing of recovery. And so this plot should, gives you a sense of the timing of recovery under different management scenarios. And we found that the mean time to recovery is about 10 years. So it's not, you know, it's not going to take 50 years. Now, 10 is, you know, there's getting over that hump is a challenge, but we found it, it could be done in about 10 years, but that there are large differences across countries. So, for example, here on, under RBFM, what we've shown here is the recovery of biomass over time under that management strategy, and the size of the, of the dot indicates the harvest, and the color of the dot indicates the profit in the year. So really, there's a lot of information to digest in this graph, but the main point is that under a BAU scenario, we think that you know, stocks will continue to decline to some extent. Um, but under either a FMSY or an RBFM scenario, we can get you know, increases in profit and increases in, in uh, stock size over time. We also addressed the management costs by country. 
So what we did is we tried to build a database, uh, and Tracy Mangin was, uh, was a key player in this, build a database of the current costs of management, which is the green, our estimate is given by the green bar per metric ton of landings. And then we tried to estimate what would be the increase in cost if you went to a rights-based fishery management scenario. And we also did this for a number of other scenarios, but I'm just showing the rights-based or catch chair scenario here. We did find that it looks like costs will increase to different degrees in different countries, but then we, when you do the cost-benefit analysis, you know, it does cost you more to do the management, but the benefit, the upside, is much, much higher than the cost. So let me just summarize the results and then I'll turn it over to Ray. Um, we found that, and some people don't like this terminology, but the triple bottom line really is possible. You can get more food or more harvest of something like, you know, possibly up to 20 million metric ton increases in harvest. You can get a really significant increase in biomass of fish in the, in the water. Um, and that's actually more than a doubling of biomass of, of fishable fish in the water. And a profit increase of something like 68 to 70 billion dollars per year by engaging in these kinds of reforms. And the reforms can happen relatively quickly in about 10 years. And there's kind of a consistent set of management interventions that we'd be happy to discuss in the Q&A that, that at least the model suggests can achieve these results. Uh, finally, the, the management costs seem to be well, the increases in management costs seem to be well worth it. Of course, we had to make lots of assumptions to, to do this analysis, um, and I've just listed a few of the caveats here, and we'd be happy to discuss these in detail. Issues of food web effects, we've tried to account for some of those, but we know we're missing others. Um, I've shown that, you know, there's these big benefits along all three dimensions. That's true in some countries. But in other countries, there are trade-offs. For example, you might have to sacrifice uh, yields in order to, to gain profits, for example. Thinking about environmental change, how will climate change affect these results? Um, and then incorporating more complex market interactions also could change the results. And we've done some sensitivity analysis on that that I'd be happy to discuss if there are questions about it. So I think what I'll do is turn it over to Ray, and I believe he'll be sharing his screen, so I think I need to unshare my screen. Yes. Um, you can... I switched it over. You should be able to... Okay, show my You'll screen. You'll have to agree to a few things, Ray. Yeah. Oops, I just clicked show my screen. Is it my, Am I showing my screen? You, you are. are. You are. Yeah. Okay, now i got to go to presentation mode as well. Yep. Okay, uh, oh, now you, are you guys seeing my, uh, my uh, go, to, go to webinars? No. No, no, you're we not. Don't. Okay. No, we don't. Um, well, great. Thanks, 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 Chris. Um, and so, the, 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 this part of the study that he uh, just de described really looks at what's the what's the status of fish stocks now, wh uh, how and how does uh, different futures in terms of management uh, look in in different uh, places and different countries? And you know, uh, the I, I, to me, there's really two key points. One is there is a large potential upside, but that potential upside is very different in different places. And uh, that one panel of Kobe plots Chris showed really emphasized that in, uh, say, Alaska, um, there's almost no potential upside in, in profit or, um, or abundance or, or catch. Uh, and that uh, the, the, the uh, Almost all the big upsides, if you remember that the, the figure, were largely in uh, the large fisheries of South and Southeast Asia, which at the moment uh, seem to have the most potential for upside. So the study I'm going to describe was a parallel study uh, that we did at the same time. Uh, Mike Melanchuk, who's a postdoc here at UW, and Emily Peterson and Matt Elliott at California Environmental Associates uh, worked on this. And what we did is a uh, survey of how fisheries are actually managed in the big fishing countries of the world and uh, and then I'm going to look at the uh, at the end of this and how the way they're managed relates to the results we found in the upside analysis so what we conducted was uh, a survey of 28 individual countries 
our, we ideally wanted five people who knew those fisheries countries to score their management system for ten species. Uh, and each person who scored it got a slightly different set of species um, so that were semi-randomized, although we made sure that each person scored the biggest fisheries in the country. And we had 46 questions uh, across five dimensions, research, management, enforcement, social economics, and stock status. And in general, the way we, well, the way we asked each person was to answer each question as either zero or one or 0.5, sort of some, some, that's somewhat true, or NA, meaning it either is not appropriate or they don't know how to answer it. Um, and this differs a lot from any previous studies of uh, how fisheries are managed, both in that it was very nuts and bolts, as you'll see some of the questions. It's really, what do they actually do in management? Uh, previous studies have tended to be a little higher level. Uh, but I think more importantly is we went species by species and looked at the specific manager of those species because within every country we looked at, there's big differences in how the species are managed. So, you know, if you, if you ask the question, does country X have an enforcement system? Well, it depends on which, 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 which species. So um, these are just some examples of the kinds of questions. So, under research, do they actually have landings data for that species of interest? Do they measure body size or age data? Do they have scientific surveys? Do they conduct stock assessments? Under management, you know, is there a, a stated objective for the fisheries management? Um, are there regulations to limit fishing pressure? Um, do they, do they, does the country have the capacity to actually change regulations and change fishing pressure? Um, under enforcement, is there dockside monitoring or at-sea observers? Are there actual penalties uh, uh, to, for compliance? Do they protect sensitive habitats? Do they actually effectively regulate discarding and bycatch? And under socioeconomics, uh, are there controls on access and entry? Um, is it, is, are the decision-making system transparent? Is there community involvement? Are there capacity-enhancing uh, subsidies? So here's just a quick summary. Uh, the x-axis is the average score by each of these governance dimensions. Uh, and what you see ranked along the, the left-hand side is the individual countries based on the average score. And what we see is there's enormous difference in the, in the countries between you know, really how much fisheries management they do. Uh, with countries like the U.S., Iceland, and Norway, for almost all the species we surveyed, uh, generally doing most of the items. Uh, if you get down to Myanmar uh, and Thailand and Brazil, uh, relatively few of the elements of fisheries management are in place. And uh, so in general, what you see is the, the, uh, the developed countries. Uh, well, I should say that, uh, that there's a pretty high correlation here between uh, how much fisheries management they do, and per capita GNP. Um, you see, uh, if you just look at the red circles, that in general the research was uh, well above, uh, let's say, uh, management and enforcement, that a uh, country like India, for instance, has a pretty uh, substantial research system, uh, but uh, it doesn't they don't really have much of a management system. Uh, and uh, But you see that the, the richer countries at the top, uh, it's a big exception, is South Africa, which for the bigger fisheries has, a, has for its economic side uh, of GDP, a very sophisticated and effective fisheries management system. Uh, then, so then you see that a lot of the European countries that have in the developed world been a bit laggards in, uh, in the nature of their fisheries management system, and countries like Argentina, Chile, Peru, Japan, really mixing right in there with, with uh, France, the UK, um, uh, Spain. Uh, and then you find the, uh, the African countries and the uh, Asian countries having really the least actual fisheries management. Um, if we look at, at uh, how individuals, so we, as I say, we aimed for five different 
people to score each country. The thing we, 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 we recruited these people based on a large network of of uh, people we knew and people and, and sort of secondary. Well, who really knows about the fisheries of Nigeria? Um, and we did find enormous difference uh, in how some of these uh, countries were ra relate, uh, rated. So if you say take India down there near the bottom, you've got one person whose average score was 20 and another was 0.8. Um, so it depended a lot on the, the, the individual person. Um, some of that variation is because they all weren't scoring the same fisheries, and we haven't gone to the, that analysis yet to, uh, to pull out how much of that. Uh, but what we have done is looked at what the, um, the person's role was. And so we classified people into six groups. Those who were academics, uh, in the fishing industry, in the uh, government management, uh, external organizations such as uh, FAO, uh, environmental NGOs, or government scientists. And not too surprisingly, there were differences. They weren't as big as I actually expected. So we found that government managers tended to rate their systems the highest, um, government scientists next. Uh, people who were outside the country completely um, tended to rate the, 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 the system the lowest. Uh, and environmental NGOs um, in uh, a little higher than that. And uh, fishing industry um, was was interesting in that it, it didn't rate the fisheries management system as high as the government employees. Um, so uh, let me now just summarize some of the uh, results where we're going to now look at what's the relationship between uh, the the intensity of fisheries management and some of the uh, analysis that Chris presented. So do fisheries that have uh, intense fisheries management system actually have uh, fisheries that perform better? Um, uh, and, and we're going to look under uh, the status quo policy or what uh, business as usual, uh, compare it to what's happening today and also comparing it to where it might be under uh, rights-based reform. And the, the key element of the rights-based reform is eliminating the competitive nature of fisheries and aiming for higher stock sizes. Um, actually, I think I will skip by this slide, these slides and go on to, uh, go on to the next one. Uh, so what the x-axis here is the average fisheries governance index. Uh, and each circle is a country, um, and so uh, the, over there on the right, 0 0.8 to 1, those are the countries that scored really high, U.S., Norway, Iceland, etc. Down on the bottom is the countries that scored very poorly at 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, typically South and Southeast Asian countries. And this is the, the percent change. Let's look at blue, which is catch. Um, under, uh, under rights-based fisheries management relative to where they are now, okay? So what you see is there's a, uh, it, it's a, a pretty low R squared, 0.3, that, but the, the countries that have good um, existing uh, high fisheries management, the, the high governance index, uh, could see an improvement in catch relative to what they're what they're now getting. Okay. Uh, now the interesting feature is that is generally by fishing more because those countries are typically have pretty conservative fisheries management systems at the moment and don't have a lot of overfished stocks. Um, you'll see in terms of catch from where you are now to uh, where you would be in 2050, the low governance uh, would see reasonably little in, well, uh, um, increase in catch and often a decrease in catch because right now they're just overfishing and from what we can tell many of their major stocks are in decline. Um, really no change in, uh, in the green, no change in the abundance of fish between where you would be in the future and where you are now. Um, but uh, there would be uh, uh, potential increase in profits uh, 
from where, where they are now to where they would be, but that increase in profits really disappears as you go towards the higher governance systems. Um, but if you compare not to where they are now, but where we think they will be under the current uh, business as usual, now we see much, much bigger differences. That under business as usual, we expect the countries that are currently overfishing to continue overfishing, to see their stocks decline, to see their profits decline, so that there's you know 300 or 400 percent upside in profitability in red for the low governance systems, uh, but effectively none for the high governance systems. Uh, that you, we see the same thing across both biomass and catch. The high governance systems, where uh, business as usual, is going to take you to more or less where you are now, and most of those countries have undergone a lot of fisheries reform, but it's in the low governance systems that we see the potential to increase. That's where the triple bottom line is. The triple bottom line for higher catch, higher biomass, and higher profits is predominantly found in the countries that simply don't have fisheries management systems that are effective at the moment. So that's the end of uh, of our analysis, and I guess we're, Chris, do you want to comment on it? Uh, no, Ray, I think you did a great job. I think we can open it up to questions. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. I, I should stop sharing now, right? Now, um, stop. You can leave it up if you want, or if you wanted to pull, if there's any websites or um, contact information you wanted to pull up, now would be a good time. Ah, hmm. No, I don't have that to pull up, so. <laughs> Um, we'll carry on. Let's see. Um, let's see. There's a couple questions I wanted to ask Ray. These are, are related. Uh, they come from two different people. Um, Ray, how did you account for limitations that come from stated responses rather than observed status? And the other question, similarly, was um, asking people to rate fisheries sounds to me like kind of a subjective exercise. How do you get rid of potential bias? Well, we, 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 well, one thing is we can compare the person's role. So, you know, we expect that, uh, and we saw that people who work in the, in the management system with the, for the government tend to be more likely to say, yes, we have this, uh, we do this effectively, or we don't. Um, I think by, by making the questions very specific, you know, uh, you know do you collect size and age data? Okay, that, that that's a much, there's much less potential bias, but obviously there are differences in how people rate it. Um, uh, we, 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 for many of these fisheries, we do have independently collected data on that, and we can go back and, and check that. Uh, but unfortunately, that we typically don't for the low governance systems. We have that information for the high governance systems. Um, and, uh, well, I mean, the, the, any time you ask for responses like this, there is bias. But you know, the the differences between uh, people's roles were not that that pronounced. So the fact that NGO people are, you know, maybe 10% lower than. Let me go back to that slide. Um, you know, so NGO people were 11% uh, lower than government managers. So those are not staggeringly big differences. But you you know. Um, uh, I mean, I, you know, my, ideally, I, 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 I've always felt that the external organization people, many of whom were, say, ex-FAO employees, they really, you know, they had broad experience and they'd seen many countries. They would be my uh, my preferred evaluators <laughs> because I, I typically didn't have a stake in it. But um, we, you know, this this was a pretty big undertaking. We ended up with 150 individuals and must have sent out a lot more emails than that. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ray. Um, and then uh, while you're on this slide, uh, there was a question. Did you include both small-scale fishermen and industrial fishermen in the group of people you asked to score fishery management uh, for, for the fishing industry? Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure of that. We did not get a lot of fishing industry responses. Um, I would have to think that in general, I mean, Again, this is this is this whole survey is it was was all of our sampling was towards the 
high volume or high value fisheries, the probability we 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 every respondent was given the four biggest stocks by tonnage in the country and the four biggest stocks by value in the country. Those many cases, those were the same. Um, and then the other stocks they were given were randomly selected from the list of stocks reported to FAO, but with the probability of being sampled higher uh, proportional to the size of the stock. So uh, a lot of the really small scale fisheries, well I should say small landing fisheries, were not included in here. Um, and uh, also we were only dealing with marine fisheries. So that's true in both what Chris reported and what I reported. We did not deal with freshwater fisheries, which tend to be uh, often very small scale, but very important to, uh, to food security. Um, so this has a definite bias towards the larger, the larger fisheries in, in all countries, as, as does fisheries management. It's very clear that fisheries management is much more intense on large stocks than small stocks. Okay, all right. Um, and this could go out to both of you, this question. Um, how evenly will the profits be distributed under rights-based fisheries management? Critics of rights-based fisheries management argue that privatization results in the concentration of fishing rights in the hands of a few powerful and wealthy. How do you respond to this criticism? Maybe I'll uh, kick that off and then Ray can chime in. I think that's a great uh, excellent critique and a really important debate. In fact, I, I think we ought to focus a whole hour on that at some point. Um, so when we say rights-based fisheries management, we aren't talking about just, you know, ITQs as you might see in the United States or Canada or, or, or Iceland. We're, that, that's certainly a, a piece of it, but we're also thinking about things like turfs or cooperatives or community allocations which are probably more appropriate for a lot of, to manage a lot of small-scale fisheries around the world. So I think that the, the answer to the, to the question that came up really has to do with how you design the rights-based approach, and it can be designed in a way to, to really be inclusive and to uh, spread the profits out across, across the fishermen. Um, it can also be designed in such a way that consolidation will likely occur if that's the most economically efficient uh, way to do that. So I think if, if equity and the distribution of, of income is a, is a goal of the program you, and you're mindful of that in the design of the, of the program, you can certainly achieve, achieve that goal. And there are lots of good examples around the world of how you might go about doing that. I guess the last thing I'll say about that is that and I welcome any follow-up questions on this. I'm really interested in this in this issue. Um, the last thing I'll say is that I, you know, I think we can mine the. It's not just sort of a theoretical exercise. We can mine the databases we've assembled to know or to estimate what the effects of consolidation are likely to be. And in some cases, when you, you know, let's say you design the rights-based program to be more equitable and more inclusive, and let's say to rule out consolidation, that can have efficiency consequences. So you might actually design the thing to do that, but then get a you know lower overall profit or efficiency as a consequence. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is a trade-off that society would have to make, and that's sort of where the challenge comes in in, in design. Ray, did you follow yeah, up on that? I, I certainly agree. It, it, it's an it's an excellent question, and I think it's certainly true that the rights-based uh, management, as it has generally been imposed, has led to consolidation um, and and very frequently elimination of of the poorer or less 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 efficient uh, fishermen. I, I guess I'm a little more skeptical than Chris that we do know how to avoid that. <laughs> um, that it's you know uh, that. that it's uh, even even when you allocate at a community level, I believe there's pretty good evidence that a few families within those communities often uh, end up uh, having having a, a lot of control. And I think that that's pro I think that's one of the key questions in fisheries management is can we achieve the benefits of stopping the race to fish uh, and and uh, at, at the same time uh, maintain or even potentially increase equity, and uh, that's, I, I think that's just a critical question, and how can that be done? Okay, anything, anything else, Chris? Okay, 
Uh, well, thank you, guys. Let's see. Um, new question. W were you able to prioritize in which countries um, is the ratio of benefits to cost greater, um, making management interventions more cost effective? Uh, another fantastic question. I love these these questions. So, yeah. So I didn't show this slide, um, and I hesitate to dig through my files on the fly here. But what I'll tell you is that when, so what I did show you is the, the current cost of management, and we scaled it per metric ton of landings for a bunch of different, you know, the big fishing countries of the world. Um, and then I, I showed you an estimate of the increase in cost by adopting, you know, different, you know, more robust management approaches. And did you so want to then, flip to those slides, Chris? I can make you present. I'm, I'm happy. To, yeah, sure. Give me the control, and I'll. Okay. Uh, I gotta, I gotta stop sharing here, right? Uh, you don't have to do anything, Ray. Okay. okay. Oh. Actually, I've lost my. I'll, I'll pull it up as I'm. Okay. Yeah. G give me a second. Okay. Yep. To pull that up. So, just one sec. Okay. So, so what? I'll, I'll pull it up, but let me talk while I'm pulling it up. So what and we you'll, you'll need to share your screen too, so we can see it. Sure, sure. Okay, share my screen. Make it bigger. Okay, can you see it now? Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. So I, I'll show. I'll go back to the. This is the slide that I showed, and what this is is it's the. It's just the current cost per metric ton in, in each of these countries, and then the the blue bar is the additional cost from adopting, you know, one of the particular, pol the most expensive policy intervention that we had. So it's, in a sense, it's an upper bound on what the cost per metric ton would be from adopting a number of different kinds of management approaches, okay? Now, I'd like to first say that there is quite a controversy out there in the literature and with the experts that we consulted with when we did this project. But a lot of people say that there really is very little connection between how much a country spends on fish, fishery management and the outcomes or the, you know, the quality of the fishery management system. In other words, there can be a lot of wasted money uh, in fishery management, and that's certainly the case if, if you go around the world and inspect these fisheries closely. Um, but you know, given the data we were able to pull together, the, the graph you see in front of you is an estimate of the cost and the additional increase in cost. So then what we did is we took, the, to address the, the question that came up, we, for each of these countries, we took that incrementing cost, the blue bar, and we compared it to the increment in profit that you would get under the management approach that gives rise to the blue bar. Okay, and, and then the ratio of those gives you the benefit cost ratio. And uh, just exactly as whoever asked this question suggested, you can then rank countries. You can say, well, what is the benefit cost ratio in Denmark compared to the benefit cost ratio in Mexico? And, at, and that gives you kind of a sense of is it more, a, you know, at least from an economic, pure economic perspective, is it more economically efficient to go and do these reforms in, in Denmark or in Mexico? And we did that and found, I guess, two striking uh, results. The first result, and I wish I had made that graph now, now that it's come up, but you kind of can imagine this thing in your, in your mind. The first uh, result is that every single country had a positive benefit cost ratio. So it was always above, above one. So the, the additional benefits of these reforms, as estimated from the model that I showed you, always outweighed the, the additional costs of the reform. The, the second striking result was that there was a huge diversity across countries. I think the lowest benefit cost ratio was like 1.5, which actually is still a pretty high benefit cost ratio, you know, 50% increase in benefits compared to costs. But the, they went all the way up to like a 10 or 20 fold increase, so 10 to 10 or 20 benefit cost ratio, um, which is a, a really, truly enormous uh, increase. So. Uh, that's kind of what I can say without actually showing you the data, but we're in the process of preparing a manuscript on this, and if anybody's really interested in that, send me an email and I'll, I'll send you the manuscript when it's ready. Okay. 
Great, thank you, Chris. And, and Nick, would you mind uh, grabbing their emails and posting them in the uh, user interface? So if anyone wants to get their emails, uh, they'll be posted in the, the webinar user interface. Sure, thank you. Okay, um, next question, let's see. Uh, we have a lot of good ones. Um, we're not going to be able to get to all of them, but I'll send them to you guys so you have them. Let's see. Um, in Chris's presentation, what accounted for differences in catch and biomass levels between managing for MSY and using rights-based fishery management? It would seem that rights-based fisheries management would set a total allowable catch probably at maximum sustainable yield, leading to the same catch and biomass outcomes. Was there some assumption in regarding managing for maximum s sustainable yield not being effective, i.e. overfishing? Wow. What, <laughs> absolutely fantastic question. Another one of my, uh, my big interests in this. So the way we uh, implemented the, the rights-based management approach, you know, imagine you're trying to do this for 5,000 fisheries, very diverse, small-scale, large-scale, you know, developing country, developed country, all kinds of different heterogeneity across these fisheries. So we had to come up with kind of a standardized uh, method for doing this. The way, the method we chose was to derive the uh, harvest control rule, or just think of it as the fishing mortality rate that would maximize the profit in the fishery, not maximize the yield in the fishery. So if you go back, maybe the, the easiest way to show this is to go back to the very beginning here. Okay, so imagine you're at the red you're at the red bubble right now, okay, and the the person asks specifically about biomass and uh, and and yield. So biomass is the x-axis and yield is the y-axis. So if you're if you're at the red bar and you're thinking of going to maximum sustainable yield, you would actually I don't know if you can see the little hand on my screen, but you would yep. go to a point like this. You go to the peak of this black curve. So that's the biomass that gives maximum sustainable yield. And you can see that it's maximum yield because it's the top of the curve. Okay. Now, the way I've drawn it, and this is true for almost every fishery in our database, the biomass that maximize the sort of rights-based fishery management biomass is to the right of that. It's bigger. In other words, you make higher profits by having more fish in the water than MSY or maximum sustainable yield would give. So you, the way I've drawn it, you'd move to the right, which means the biomass is higher. And by moving to the right, the yield goes down a little bit. So the yield is actually lower under rights-based fishery management than under maximum sustainable yield. Now that's true in equilibrium. You know, once you achieve that, once you've put the policy in place and wait until the policy achieves equilibrium, in the transition time, they could be different. You know, it could go either way, but at least the yield could. The biomass wouldn't, but the yield could. Um, so I guess that's maybe a short answer to your question: is that the rights-based fishery management in our model tends to be tends to leave more fish in the water, and that tends to give slightly lower yield in equilibrium than the than the FMSY policy would. Yeah, I might I might add that Australia is the one country I know of that has officially adopted that as their formal harvest strategy. They don't aim for maximum sustained yield; they aim for maximum economic yield, which generally gives you about 20% higher biomass than maximum sustainable yield, but lower catch. Okay. Uh Thank you again. Let's see. So let's talk climate change. We got two climate change que related questions. Um, first of all, do your studies and models account for the impacts of climate change, um, i.e. warming of ocean water acidification on the health of fisheries? And the other question we got uh, is, what are your thoughts on the possible effects of climate change? It seems like there's potential to disrupt many fish stocks and make fisheries management more difficult. Quite simply, the answer to the first is no. <laughs> we we didn't. There's nothing in this analysis that is, uh, is is where we've considered explicitly climate change, as far as as far as I know. Uh, maybe Chris has a different thought. And the answer to the second is yes. I would expect climate change and ocean acidification to change things a lot. Uh, and uh, and 
you know, uh, I, but I don't think we can predict what the changes will be. What we need to do is have fisheries management systems that are adaptive and respond to the changes that take place, because presumably some species will benefit and some will lose. Okay. So I have a, a follow-up to that. Um, I agree with Ray. So the, the, and the results we've shown you here do not explicitly account for climate change, but we are, a number of us are uh, embarking on a, an effort to incorporate climate change into this same type of analysis. And so th the idea would be, you know, suppose that um, you knew that, for example, car the carrying capacity of a, of a particular fish stock was going to shrink by 5% per year for the next 20 years or something along those lines. So you had some prediction about the change in a parameter of the model. That can be incorporated into these projections, and then you can ask for a given institutional regime, you know, an FMSY regime or a rights-based regime, if you account for that, that change over time, how does that change what you do today? And then how does that change your projection into the future about what the consequences of you know, policy A against policy B would be? So we're in, actively engaged in that process right now. It's a, you know, it's a very complicated thing to do at, this, at a global scale, but we're uh, actively engaged in, in trying to do that. But the results we've shown you so far don't, don't incorporate that. Um, the second thing I would say is just echo what Ray said, but maybe say it in a slightly different way, that you know, the, so far what, at least from the work we've done on climate change and thinking about fisheries and climate changes, you're, you're much better off thinking about designing robust institutions, so institutions that are robust to climate, to climate change, rather than really trying to predict the actual details of climate change, because it's just sort of very hard to think about specific management interventions for you know a large swath of fisheries when there's so much uncertainty about what the actual consequences will be but if you design institutions that are robust to a you know to a broad range of possible climate futures i think that's a much more that's a much safer way to go okay all right thank you chris thank you ray um, two more questions uh, the first one is rights based management and triple bottom line outcomes, are they more effective in single species um, fisheries management plans or versus multi-species fisheries? Um, and then as a single example of sea, a single species was uh, sea scallops, an example of a multi-species fishery was New England ground fish. Yeah, let me let me start. Uh, that, that is certainly, I'd say, one of the, the key issues we haven't been able to deal with very well, and that is, uh, you know, we, we know in, in multi-species fisheries you can't have everything at MSY, <laughs> and, uh, and yet our analysis is really based on, on, on that assumption, because we do this kind of production curve you see on the screen right now, we assume that's the same for, for all, all species. So uh, we're probably overly optimistic about how much uh, you can the benefits you can achieve by, by managing each species separately because you can't do that all the time and that's particularly true in uh, in the in the in the big mixed tropical fisheries of South and Southeast Asia where you know you're talking hundreds of species caught at a, at a time and uh, uh, you know another iteration on this analysis would be one where we try to uh, look at the the yield curve, not by fish stock, but by aggregate, you know, by the kinds of fish that are caught in a fishery, and we, we know that those will look somewhat different. But I'm, I would say I'm pretty confident that our estimates on uh, on abundance and our estimates on profitability are pretty robust to that. But I suspect our, we're overly optimistic about uh, catch that uh, that the actual benefits of of reducing effort on catch are probably less in mixed stock fisheries than, than, than we're estimating. If, Sarah, could I quickly follow up on that? Sure, absolutely. I know we're running out of time, but just, just quickly, two, two quick things. First of all, Ray, Ray, I think, misspoke saying that every, I think he said this, we assume that the curve is the same for all species. I know he didn't really mean that, but the, the curve is specific to each fishery, but, but he has seen Right, right, but we assume that each fishery has a curve individually, and I think that's what he was getting at. The, 
I think I disagree with Ray a little bit on this because you know so we one of the things we do is we after we estimate the parameters for all these 5,000 fisheries, we add up the implied maximum sustainable yields for each fishery, and they come out to about 100 million metric tons, which is a, so the global MSY of the ocean in our estimate is about 100 million metric tons. And that seems very consistent with other estimates that have been made and with, you know, current catches and so forth. So it's not, I, I don't think we're grossly overstating uh, the, the, the possible yield from these fisheries. But I do agree with Ray that it's much more complicated to draw these conclusions in multi-species fisheries. But I think the question from the audience was actually more about our rights-based fishery management and its efficacy under multi-species versus single species. And we could go on and on about this, and I'm, it's a very, very interesting issue. There have been lots of great successes in RBFM in mixed fisheries. Um, but there also have been lots of, of failures and lots of lessons learned. So I, I'm not sure that we have the exact answer. There are definitely pluses and minuses of each, and, but it's a challenging issue, and it's one that I think deserves a lot more attention than, it, than it's gotten. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Well, I'm going to say we have a ton more really great questions. Uh, I'm going to wrap up with the last question, which you cannot possibly answer in four minutes. Um, uh, how do you think these findings could be implemented in the Caribbean with almost no fishery management and low governance? Ray, would you like to take a crack at that? Um, well, there's, I mean, there's a, a range of interventions you can you can do. You can you can help build science infrastructure. You can help build the, the, the build, help build the governance. I mean, I think it's pretty clear that. Um, that we have to first figure out what the appropriate scale of governance is, and and some countries top down isn't going to work. The the governance needs to be developed at the regional or community level. So it, and it's probably I, I think the answer is going to depend on every are going to be different for every country. But you've got to figure out what the possible interventions are, and within the social economic context of those countries, which of those interventions are more likely to uh, prove successful. And I would just add to that that uh, you know two of the biggest interventions that that we're finding are tend to be effective are you know having a sense having a stock assessment of some sort and there are lots of new data core stock assessment techniques that are would be useful in Caribbean fisheries and and actually are being implemented there by a number of groups and and the second is having you know strong governance or a good good management regime and I think that the kind of thing that might be useful in the Caribbean would be things like TERFs or cooperatives, which actually are being used in parts of the Caribbean. I, I know Cuba has um, a series of, of cooperatives for some of their fisheries, and some of them are performing quite well. So, you know, I don't, I don't think it's out of the question that those kinds of tools could be adopted more broadly in that region. Okay. All right. Good job, guys. Um, but that, that, that does bring up one other one I, that I will bring out then. Um, on Ray's slide with a graph with countries on the y-axis and index score on the x-axis, there is a clear trend that research was ranked most highly in general across countries. Do you have any thoughts on this, or did you probe this finding at all? It seems this would confirm general understanding that science is not being translated to management enforcement. Yeah, I mean, I, if you, I, I, I suspect that, uh, I mean, I think it's true that there are lots of countries that have a, a more of a science system than, than, and, but don't have much of an enforcement system. Uh, and if you were to ask uh, what would it, what, what's, you know, what's missing in those countries, I think it's, uh, it's not, you know, the science isn't the, high, the highest priority. It's the, uh, it's the ability to actually have effective regulation and, and enforce them. Um, okay, just, Chris. uh, Chris, did you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, no, no, sounds good. Okay, great. Well, thank you guys. Um, just to let everyone know, there will be a recording of this webinar that's going to be posted on the Open Channels website 
probably in a couple of hours. Um, and within the, the user interface, if you quick want to jot it down now, are the contact information for Gray and Chris. Um, I know at least one of the question askers really would like you to address that their question um, about highly migratory species. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you to everyone. Um, Ray and Chris, this was great. Um, so this was super, and, and thank you to everyone who participated. This was uh, really great engagement and I'm glad we were able to to delve into this topic. And so thank uh, you very and, much Sarah. So Thanks very much. Thank okay. All right. And I hope everyone has a great afternoon.